Well, welcome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And for those of you in Asia that are uh, staying up in the middle of the night, um, good, good early morning. Um, thanks for joining. This week, we're going to dig into uh, the topic of leveraging anchor institutions. And we have a great panel here. Um, as we do each week, we're going to keep this to an hour. I really am excited about getting your questions. I also have a number of questions um, and comments that we've gotten from the discussion boards this week that I'll sort of bring into the discussion. Um, so the way we'll do it is I'll just have our panelists that are here with us in Cleveland do a quick introduction of themselves. And we have one remote panelist. And then we'll get right to the discussion. So Steve? Thanks. Thanks, Michael. And welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Gerard. I'm a scientist and engineer by training and by way of career. Um, I'm currently a CEO of a medical device startup, Securus Medical Group. And I've spent uh, the bulk of my career going between big companies, uh, Boston Scientific and Johnson & Johnson, and small companies. I've worked in uh, startups as well as in, in venture capital. Great. Thanks, Steve. Joe? I'm Joe Jankowski. I am the Chief Innovation Officer for Case Western Reserve University. And in that capacity, I work closely with uh, spin-offs of the university as well as um, companies in the region who, who did not come from the university, but either work with the university in order to access their scientists, their hospitals, or even at times their capital and or uh, talented resources. So I've, uh, I've been working in the space in the region for a little over a decade. Great. Thanks, Joe. Dave? My name is Dave Neundorfer. I'm the CEO of Linestream Technologies. Uh, we spun out of one of the anchor institutions here in Cleveland, uh, Cleveland State University in 2008. Uh, prior to that, I was with Eaton Corporation, another uh, Cleveland company much bigger uh, in their automotive group, and I'm a mechanical engineer by training. Great, thanks. And uh, Alexis is coming to us from Crete. Alexis, can you hear me? Can you? Great. Can uh, you introduce yourself, please? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, um, so I'm Alexis Conselis. I manage the Center for Entrepreneurship at uh, and uh, my main capacity here is the localization effort that we have done in order to make this MOOC accessible to, uh, to Greeks uh, in the Greek language. And today we are at the foundation of research uh, here in Crete, in Heraklion, where more than 1,300 uh, scientists and uh, researchers work on new technologies. You can see some of the posters back uh, behind me. Great. Thanks, Alexis. And what we thought we would do today, and Alexis um, is hosting is, uh, a meetup right now in Crete. So I've asked him to gather a couple of folks that are at the meetup in Crete just to kick off the discussion today with questions. So we'll just take those questions sort of as a group, and then we'll um, have our panelists discuss it. And again, for those of you who are watching, look forward to getting your questions. So just let uh, our team know when you want to ask a question, and we can go to you via uh, live, if you have a camera and a microphone, just audio, or if you feel more comfortable just sending it via text, you can do that. So back to you, Alexis, for the first couple of questions from our folks in Greece. Yes, of course, we have um, 100 people approximately downstairs at our meetup, and two of them are here with us to ask uh, specific questions. Minas, could you please come over? Thank you. Hey. Good, hello, Joe. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. I'm uh, Minas Karandidis from uh, Greece. I have a question um, to Mr. Jankowski. Uh, uh, my question is, what is the most challenging issue in commercializing academic and university-based research? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> what are the 10 most challenging things? I know. Um, there's really two, I think, prime categories that always fall into play. One is that the origin of the research has rarely um, started to, to, it wasn't meant to be commercial. Not to say that it doesn't want to be commercial, but in the United States, at least, most of our research has been funded um, at the confluence of two things. One is the scientific inquiry or interests of the investigator, and then that confluence is with the federal funding, in our case, usually the National Institutes for Health or the National Science Foundation. So you're starting with a technology or an opportunity that may actually have some commercial merit, but that's not what where it was originally founded. So you have to do a lot of uh, uh, working with the investigator, working with the patent office, other um, 
you know, things to sort of massage or polish that opportunity to see if there really is a commercial property there because, you know, again, it's being adopted into a commercial setting, if you will. The second that certainly comes up, especially early stage when we're first trying to work with it, is trying to find the financing. We're always dealing with, you know, high risk, high reward technologies. And when you're really looking for financing, um, your, your financing suddenly again goes to, it's not just are we willing to accept the value proposition and that this could become very valuable, but do we believe in the leadership, the, you know, the entrepreneur, the team that will take this forward? And when you're dealing with a, a company that hasn't existed prior if this is a spinoff or if you're dealing with a very small company, there's an element of risk that again goes beyond just the technical risk. It's a question of, and even beyond the market risk, it's a question of the uh, operational or execution risk of does that team, does that person have the ability to take it forward? So again, you then balance the fact that you're dealing with high risk technologies that really weren't thought of originally as products and now you're trying to place it in a uncertain or unknown leadership team that's usually with those two areas are enough to, to keep you up at night and lead to you know, a high failure rate, but of course when they're navigated well, to lead to some very transformational opportunities as well. Okay. Great, I'm sure Steve. To, to great answer. I, they're coming at this from a, more of a corporate uh, acquirer standpoint, one of the bigger challenges I think universities have is positioning the technology properly for consumption by an outside party. So I uh, spent a lot of time myself and with teams looking at technologies at universities and often um, how the technology is positioned isn't exactly uh, attractive to a potential acquirer. So uh, sort of understanding that communication at that interface I think is really important. And uh, from the university standpoint, positioning the technology to really solve a problem that the company has, it, it sounds easy, but I think it's really incumbent on the universities to truly understand the potential markets they would be selling that technology into and to try to position very early stage technologies in most cases in, in light of the future needs of the company. Um, yeah, and that's a great point. That is that whole position of, again, the original position of the, of the I like Steve's term there, uh, the original positioning was to address a hypothesis, right? We're going with hypothesis-driven research. Suddenly you have to flip that switch of, now can we position this to serve as a potential you know, product line or service line for a company, and, and that is uh, no small feat. Great, thanks. Alexis, let's go back to you and Creep for the second uh, question from a participant. Hello, everybody. Uh, Miles uh, from Crip. Uh, I would like to ask you, Mr. Stephen Pilar, how can a large corporation benefit from funding external research and why not do it within their own organization? How can they benefit right. from funding? What was the Thanks. last part Maybe of the question? Just repeat the last part of the question. We could hear the first part. How can a large corporation right. benefit? And what was the second part of the question? Why not do it within their own uh, organization? Okay. Why, Why not, not do it within their own oh, organization? So great that, question. That's a great question. With uh, there's there's lots to it. Um, you know, I think first of all, if you look at most corporations globally today, R and D budgets internally. So I'll answer the second part first. Most R and D budgets are shrinking. I think with the economic pressures most companies are facing, they're looking for internal uh, avenues to. Uh, to, to trim spending, and I, unfortunately, a lot of that comes uh, in trimming R&D that goes into longer-term uh, product development uh, activities. So there's a lot of internal pressure that, that limits uh, the use of resources. You know, I, you're seeing companies increasingly look outside for filling their pipelines, either into the venture community and startup community, uh, or to universities to build early relationships, uh, you know, to have a line of sight to future technologies that will, will ultimately fill their pipelines. The, um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of benefit to companies in, in getting involved with universities early. I'd, when I was at Johnson & Johnson, we had a very, I'd say, a very well-directed program uh, looking into universities across the globe to try to understand where technology was going. If for no other reason, we would do it to have a better line of sight and perspective into the, the, the future world, what technologies are possible and what types of solutions, particularly in the case of uh, solutions for solving medical problems, were, were emerging from the university landscape. If nothing else, it made us better informed uh, at making our other you know, financing decisions, funding decisions, and acquisition decisions. Great. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Suzanne, let's go to the, to the um, chat room. So we have a question from Ecta, and she's joining us again this week from Belize. And her question is, how can an anchor institution raise capital if there is not enough support from foundations or donors? 
Great. So let's um, let's take that. Maybe Joe, I'll go to you. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about um, what you've had to do because I think there's there's different when we talk about skin in the game. Yeah. Um, how you raise capital to ultimately support entrepreneurs, and we have our Case Technology Ventures Fund. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the structure of that and how you go to outside folks to um, provide capital for it. Yeah, absolutely, and, and I'll say that that's a great question in that even in the question you start to see that there are d the many different funding elements that need to be engaged. So we've already touched on, on a prime one, which is at the very early stages, it's the, the federal government. And that usually is gonna pay more for research than for commercialization. You see a little bit of movement towards a little downstream, and there are a few select programs now, but for the most part, you're right, it's, it's not gonna come from what we would consider traditional federal support. So then you start to say, well, where's the next place we can get money? You mentioned foundations. Foundations are, are critically important, especially um, in the world of commercialization, I would say, in uh, disease or focus specific. So we've had a lot of success partnering with spin-off companies and even with larger enterprises at times of working on a technology sector specific area. So, you know, the Myelin Repair Foundation with a mission towards multiple sclerosis or the, you know, March of Dimes or even in energy, you saw uh, some of these outcroppings of foundations, philanthropic organizations saying we want to fund um, companies or partnerships with the anchor institutions towards given outcomes that meet our cause. So, so that certainly is an area where again we search. Um, but beyond, of course, foundation and public support, um, you start to look for those areas of intersection with the capital markets. The most uh, common one, at least in the US, are what we call angel investors, who are groups that will say, well, we're not gonna give the money to the anchor institution per se, but we would love to work with the anchor institution so that as new enterprises emerge, or as uh, enterprises enter a growth stage, maybe because of their continued activities at the hospital or at the university, we're in place now to, to take an investment going forward. Um, and so we've worked uh, closely with, you know, what you would create is what we'll call a, a funding network or syndicate. And then finally, as, as Michael was touching on, um, through the state of Ohio, we've been uh, benefited through an economic development play that does recognize the need as well as the difficulties in financing the earliest stages of uh, technology coming from anchor institutions. And we've been able to be <coughs> supplemented by them um, to create what we call a, a seed fund uh, first money in fund is another name at times given, but it really is focused on the earliest stage investments into a company, really at the point of company launch, to, to get that first investment that lets it leave the campus, if you will. They may still have activities on campus, but it lets it now start to begin operating as a for-profit concern. And usually that money is spent in one of two very important ways, either risk reduction, we're gonna pay for a functional stereotype or an animal study, or in hiring that first leader, that first person who's really gonna eat, sleep, and drink that company. Um, so long story short, you gotta look at all the buckets of money and try to piece them together towards a given opportunity. Great, thanks Joe. Suzanne? We have a question from Eugenia, who's joining us today from Dallas, Texas. When a technology is developed with federal or other funding from a university, are there rules or rules of thumb about what can be taken by the investigators and outside partners to be the basis of a commercial company? Great question. Dave, maybe I'll um, toss it down to you. I mean, you um, came into LineStream after the technology had been sort of in the research lab for a number of years. You were a Stanford Business School student, sort of looking at that point, I think that the question kind of gets at where they're looking to commercialize the technology. Maybe from your perspective, as you sort of were looking in at this as a commercial opportunity, what did you sort of see in that underlying technology? And then what were the sort of challenges to, to get it on a path to turn it into a commercial company? So it's a great question. Uh, what, what we saw um, at the stage when I was introduced to the company was uh, a great underlying technology. Uh, and I use that word deliberately, technology, not a product. Uh, with some underlying patent applications. They weren't full uh, patents at that time. Um, and what interested me and the investors who were uh, looking at this technology and considering spinning it out uh, was the performance of it in uh, some simulation tests. So they had some simulation performance improvement, uh, and this is technology that was being envisioned uh, in, in a manufacturing plant. So you know, things like 20% improvement in throughput or 10% improvement in energy efficiency. 
Um, those were the compelling areas that I think got everybody outside of the university excited about potentially commercializing the technology. Um, I think the, the core IP was really related back to uh, the patents that had been applied for at the time. Um, so those patents were in process. Uh, they had been applied for under the auspices of Cleveland State University. Uh, Cleveland State had uh, reached out to their own counsel uh, for those patents, and really that became the foundation of our license agreement. Uh, so Cleveland State University ended up providing uh, the spin-out company that became Linestream Technology uh, a license to commercialize and productize uh, the technology that was captured in the three core patents that we had at the time. Just the role of federal funding and the strings that may or may not be yeah, attached yeah. to intellectual there, property. There are strings. <laughs> there are strings. There are rules. Um, but I want to focus on, on rules on both sides. So the rules that that can affect, you know, at the negative side or constraining. You know, I don't say always negative, but but the rules we have to be careful. The two prime ones that come up, and, and Dave touched on this, are you have to license the technology. We're not allowed to transfer ownership. So if the feds uh, and the federal government has been very smart for once in saying if we're going to uh, determine if something has federal support the rule is one dollar or more so it doesn't come into well it was mostly federally supported or it wasn't a dollar or more it's considered federally funded if it was federally funded the university cannot sell the asset they can license it so we give you rights but but we're not selling you the patent or the intellectual uh, data um, so that's one prime one that can uh, at times cause heartburn or can can change uh, matters the second one which is even more difficult because it's so subjective is that we have to uh, extract fair market value. The the federal government wants enterprises to be created and they want a, a, a beneficial partnership between the investment the public makes in research and the company outcroppings, but the flip side is they don't want it abused. They don't want one company, you know, they would they would be scared if General Electric came and said, we'll buy all your technology for a given, uh, uh, you know, number. So they'll say, well, you have to have each exchange be at fair market value. So those are two encumbrances that are often encountered. But what, what people have to realize on the other side is another rule is that we're supposed to do this. It's not just that we're allowed, but when we take on an obligation of federal funding and there is an invention, we actually have to attest to use com best commercial diligence to place the technology in the private sector. So that's a rule also that comes into play because we will at times then be given some strength to say, this is our best chance to put this in the hands of the public. And you, we can use that to sort of uh, mitigate some of the uncertainty around the, the previous constraints, which of course was fair market value and such. So, so there are definitely rules in the US and I think a lot of them have been emulated worldwide. Um, but the prime ones again are you can't sell the patent and you have to look for fair market exchange. Good. Thanks, Joe and Dave. Um, there, was a, there was a comment in the chat room from um, Garrett Delcourt from France who was talking about um, commercialization activity um, at, at institutions and really was saying in, in the French experience, and Alexis, this is a question I want to ask for you, that institutions are rich of, of really talented researchers, but most of the time they are good at fundamental research um, or at inventing. This is not innovation. Innovation is an invention that finds a market, which is sort of consistent with what Steve said. Alexis, maybe you can tell us a little bit about Greece. Is that, is that experience that you're having in Greece sort of similar, where the, the institutions are sort of coming up with research, but it's not finding a path into the commercial market? I, I would agree. I think Europe in general has a problem with commercialization. and. Uh, going back to the discussion you had before, this might also be because most of the funds come from the European Union. So there is a safety bubble uh, within the uh, research institute to stay back and get money passively instead of developing some, something that is good for the wider public and can be marketed. A another issue that I would find in this direction is that we usually go for amazing, innovative, uh, uniquely uh, groundbreaking, um, let's say, research or findings, and we ignore the medium level innovation that can actually help uh, small and medium enterprises overcome specific issues that might be trivial to the researcher, but they are not to the market. So th there seems to be a mismatch between what the SME sector that is dominating Europe actually needs in terms of innovation and what research institutes develop. Great, thanks. Anybody else want to, on the panel want to sort of reflect on that 
um, the challenge of getting kind of basic research into commercial entities? Yeah, I mean, I can jump at it. Uh, you know, it, it, one of the biggest challenges, of course, is basic research. It just tends to be really too early for most established companies. So, uh, it, it's 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 challenging in a bunch of ways. One, you know, the university investigators are typically not commercially oriented, so the work itself is aimed at you know a different end. It's aimed at the next grant. It's aimed at publication. You know, it's aimed at sort of intellectual you know findings and publishable results. Uh, and I guess back to my earlier comment, it's, it, you end up having a bit of a language mismatch. You know, companies are looking for things that are new and revolutionary and enabling of their markets, um, but th they may look at that technology in a completely different light and, and see it as something that could potentially solve, solve a problem for them. The, the biggest issue, of course, is that companies, large companies in particular, are, are generally interested in spending a lot of money on basic research. So you need to find a common ground where sort of the next segment of fundable work leads to something on a commercial pathway, answers some critical question that would gate a next uh, funding event. Great. Um, there was a question. Oh, David, do you want to add something? I'd just be interested to hear from you guys the role of sponsored research um, for a, a researcher or an investigator. Uh, early on in their research, they have an idea. They think they're solving a real pain. Uh, but reaching out to industry uh, or to uh, a company that they think might be a licensor of, of the ultimate technology early on, not to try to uh, get them to license at day one, but just to get feedback, kind of applying the lean startup model to maybe five years of research. Um, are you seeing that at, at, at Case? Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge fan of it. And to your point is a, a lot of times they'll, they'll put the, you know, they'll forget the, the means and look for the ends and the research will say, oh, I, I hope that, you know, BASF pays for this. And to your point, a lot of times the real value there isn't that you're going to get it paid for because we may even think they're not going to license it. It's right. way too early. But that perspective can be great. Yeah. The fact that they say, you know, we've seen this before and here's the issue here. Or we like this, here's what it would take. You know, here's when we will be interested. To me, that is the real value there because in perspective, about 98% of, uh, of our money does not come from industry, right? It's coming from the feds and, and from softer uh, foundation monies. Um, but the 2%, even though you'd say, well, it's not much, why do you bother at all? That perspective can be huge when a corporation says, here's where the market's going or here's, here's our pain points we're looking for you to solve. And if you can reach this point, then we'd be interested. Right. And I think you're going to see more of that, right. both because I think it's valuable and, and I think we're evolving as institutions, but also because I think as the uh, federal pipeline dries up, is there's a lot of thoughts, of course, to those who track in the U.S. that there won't be as much basic research left. And as Steve noted, uh, uh, internal R&D, the, the giant corporate labs are, are, are things of the past for the most part. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see them sort of being pushed together and saying, let's talk a little bit more about how we can interact. I think it can be a good way to, to maintain true north over years of research and turnover of, re, of researchers, undergrad, masters, and PhD students. Uh, it's really easy for that core idea to have some creep. And if you have touch points once a quarter or you know, twice a year, whatever it might be, with the industry or the company whose problem you're trying to solve, uh, that can, again, provide true north and maybe end up uh, spurring some some sponsored research dollars yeah. down the line. No, well said. And then again, beyond the dollars, you touched on a, a huge one too, which is even though I'm sure there have been companies that have done well sponsoring research, and you know, and usually you see it in certain pockets where they, they go back to the well and do it a lot. Yep. One of the huge outputs is access to talent that yep. they end up hiring those students, That's and that right. may be more important than actually what came out in terms sure. of a patent or that. You know, we had a question in the chat room um, in the discussion boards from Lilla Rudikon, also from Greece. Um, and, and she kind of got at a core thing that we were kind of capturing in the video lecture, and, and I'll pose it to you, Dave, and maybe with a comment from Alexis afterwards. And she asked, why would a university or hospital potentially be interest, more interested in licensing a technology to a company instead of trying to spin out the research in a startup company? When you look back on the history of Linestream, were there, were there moments before they decided to take the path and sort of bring you in and commercialize it where they were trying to license it to a big strategic, and were those efforts not successful that eventually sort of led it to, to being a spin-out, or was it a better fit as a spin-out? Prior company? to spinning out what's now Linestream, there were, I think, two and a half, three years inside of Cleveland State University where a professor and a team of students uh, tried to license directly to a, a large company. 
Uh, and I think what they ended up uh, getting in return is you know, a lot of feedback on their technology and their idea, which is great. I think they got some, uh, some, some lab equipment out of it, which was great. Uh, but to Steve's earlier point, it was just too early for a large technology to be able to consume, or sorry, a large company to be able to consume that technology. Um, so I, I think after drilling a few dry holes, uh, and again, in, in the meantime, in parallel, evolving uh, the technology, evolving what became our first product, uh, they decided that if, if there was a way to get some, some outside influence, uh, enhance access to capital, uh, and then also uh, find a few people on the team that could help bridge the gap between academia uh, and, uh, and industry, uh, that became, I think, their, their best option in the 2007-2008 timeframe. Great. Alexis, did you want to comment on, on how that plays out in Greece? It has a, a, a very interesting field of research that can actually boost, uh, in Greece specifically, local economy, because most of the university uh, hospitals are outside of Athens. Unfortunately, we don't see many um, innovations coming out and being applied. For example, at the University of Ioannina, we have a, a very strong uh, medical robotics um, section. They are doing really good, really great, but they do have problems with getting out to the international market because that's where they should be going. It's both an issue of bureaucracy and an issue of funds that can help them actually grow outside the, the university hospital and apply what they have tried out. And of course, not to comment on the uh, cost of such research, especially if we go to, to, to medicines or new medical applications. Great, thanks, Alexis. Suzanne, we have somebody in the chat room. We actually have somebody live with video and audio. So Christos, if you'd like to begin your conversation with the panel. Uh, I have a question for my fellow Greeks in Crete. Uh, did you manage to point out any similarities with the center was from the experts on the other side of the pond? And do you think that some of the methods already been made in the States to boost entrepreneurship some time ago could be tailored or to be used in Greece? Thanks. Alexis? I, I didn't get I didn't get the question clear. Could you please repeat, Michael? Uh, maybe, maybe Christos, can you can you just uh, re repeat it if if you want? Yes, to we 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 have heard uh, in those uh, four weeks of the course a lot of methods that were implemented a long time ago from experts in the states in order to find ways to boost entrepreneurship and reverse the course in your home state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if uh, my fellow Greeks in Crete that are there and in the, have found anything that could be used, that could be tailored and imported from the methods used in the States in order to follow the same steps here in Greece? Yes, that, that, that's actually a, a great anxiety that we had when we started working with Michael on, on this course. Um, the Cleveland experiment, I think Michael, you call it sometimes, uh, is there to show that there are different ways, especially when you manage to have a successful cooperation between the government, philanthropic foundations, philanthropic uh, venture capital, let's say, and, uh, and venture capital per se. I think in Greece we still need to grow all these elements so that we can, in essence, copy what is happening in the state in, in order to implement it in a similar way. At the same time, what we see from our discussions with both entrepreneurs and our experts that come along to our meetups, we see a, a trend that says, forget about the government, forget about the organization. If you want to do it, you will do it. it it's obviously not that simple if you want to start a business, or start a business, but um, there seems to be a momentum, especially in terms of uh, investment in the ICT sector, with the Jeremy uh, venture capital that are available that can help uh, companies that have a well thought business model grow. So I would say the government needs to set up a policy and identify new ways of going about entrepreneurship in Greece, but at the same time, the entrepreneurial community needs to look beyond that and, and start working on implementing. Great. Thanks, Christos, for the question. 
Um, You're welcome. There's, there's a question that came in in, the, uh, in one of the, the forums. There's actually a really nice group that's formed around in Africa discussing some of these challenges. And I think in, in one way we recognize that in a university like Case Western Reserve, where we have $400 million of research funding coming in, we're sort of heavy in medical, that the situation may be very different in, in Africa. So Lori um, Picard, writing in from Rwanda, she had written that, in my experience, anchor institutions in developing countries aren't nearly as strong as those, developing as those in developed countries. They don't get a lot of funding for research and have the same level of prestige and are generally too busy providing services to do much else. This goes for both universities and hospitals. Um, agricultural research and extension organizations do exist, but they're overstretched. So what, what can anchor institutions in these types of environments do? I know it's hard, but as you think about some of the travels or people that have come, what, how much, Joe, any, yeah. any reflections yeah, on that? Yeah, in fact, it's, it's something that I personally am passionate about. It's where I transitioned um, over the last few years from being the technology uh, t transfer leader in which we were predicated on a huge research base to the innovation leader, which really said beyond research, there are things anchor institutions can and should do, right? And in fact, I could argue that I think it's more more important than being a large research institution. You know, Steve and David pointed out that the research, while though even at a world-class institution, has potential value, it's very early. Meanwhile, anchor institutions, even ones that aren't giant research, they're foremost a place for talent. I mean, the, the fact that you have young, you know, energetic minds coming out, I think that's the primary anchor in the, in the region that you can potentially grow an entrepreneurial culture around. And then two is the fact that um, they're a, a student Student, students themselves are, are emerging again amazingly so in the last 10 years as the leaders. I would say my first, you know, in the, in the 1990s and 2000s, you looked to entrepreneurs being the suits. Maybe uh, he or she would retire at about age 55 and said, I'm too young to, to just golf every day, so what I'm going to do is try to run my own company. Um, now we're looking to students who are going to say, let's create your first job. So again, I don't think you need to be a, a giant research institution to have these two assets. The fact that you are a, a, a collection of talent and that the university can at some point become the commons in which deal flow and idea exchange exists and that at times can be the outcroppings of economic opportunity. And the fact that students are now being seen as the groups to lead uh, young companies rather than having to wait till it's your second generation career. And again, I, don't, I know it, there are challenges in every region, but I, do, I no longer think you need to be predicated on a giant research base in order to have impact as an anchor institution. And Steve, you've worked outside, you've lived in Cleveland, you've worked outside of Cleveland, you've worked internationally. Any, any other any reflections on what you're seeing in other markets? Well, I would just say generally every region, uh, Rwanda or, or Cleveland, has its set of assets. I think you really need to make an assessment of what that is and, and make the best of what you have. You have to start somewhere. And uh, I think it starts uh, largely with a, in it, a long view and intent to, to sort of change the ecosystem. You know, having uh, certainly in, in that environment where, where there must be some successful businesses that could benefit from working with, uh, uh, with universities and so forth. You know, kind of building an early group of like-minded individuals that have a long-term intent of changing the innovation ecosystem, I think is sort of the necessary first step for, uh, you know, for, for changing the local, local economy. But again, I think it really kind of peel it all back. You have to really take an assessment of what, what are your assets. Every region has them. Uh, they're different in, in every part of the globe. And even within, you know, within, within a country, regionally, they're quite different. So you know, start with what you have and, and build, uh, build from there and take the long view. Um, Great. You know, things will Thanks. work out. Suzanne? Oh, sorry, sure, Alexis. Sure, Alexis. I just wanted to, to say that in, in our example for anchor institutions, we are using two institutions. The American Farm School in Thessaloniki that was founded by a missionary who adopted eight, uh, a family, uh, eight children without family and trained them to be farmers. And it has a long tradition in, in serving family farming with innovative uh, cultivating knowledge, I mean, for growing new crops or being more uh, market uh, oriented. And the, the other example is the State Museum of Modern Art that is encouraging young designers to, to create and to, to work around the museum activity. So I, I think exactly like the last point, um, like the last point that was made, it, it's not about uh, um, amazing or let's say increased innovation level. 
It is all about what you can do to change incrementally the entrepreneurial activity within your region. Great. Thanks, Alexis. Suzanne? We have a question from Moses, who is coming to us today from Kenya. Anchor institutions are a great opportunity for entrepreneurs since it offers a ready market for almost everything imaginable. However, most of these institutions are either controlled by the government or the government is a major shareholder. Unfortunately, this stifles the energy, creativity, and innovativeness of the entrepreneurs since they are not given an opportunity to be part of the supply chain. How can we, as upcoming advisors, ensure that anchor institutions, from the basic understanding, offer a ready market for our entrepreneurs? That's a great question. Thanks, Moses. And, you know, it's an interesting, and I think we see this regardless of the products. I mean, Dave, your, your, your product may not necessarily be well suited for a university as a customer, but I think sort of in general, as we think about entrepreneurs developing products, oftentimes they're sort of starting like ultra local. Right. Um, any reflections, just sort of broadly speaking, not, maybe not from a line stream perspective on sort of how, how entrepreneurs can sort of start at, at maybe at a university and start, or even from your Stanford experience? I, I think it all stems from finding a challenge, finding a pain point that you think you might be able to address and, and confirming that uh, if, if you did find a solution that somebody would be interested in it. And I think that's the core aspect of all great entrepreneurial ideas. and and you don't have to look far uh, oftentimes for that pain point. So I think to your point, Michael, can you look in your backyard? Can you, can you look within your school, outside of your school? Um, and can you begin uh, ideating with a, a group of people, your fellow classmates, friends, uh, around uh, you know, helping to solve this pain point and putting together ideas? And I think that's the, that's the core catalyst for uh, maybe that process to begin starting. Joe, have we seen any of our, I mean, in, in addition to the, uh, to the heavy healthcare emphasis, we have other um, student-led companies that start here at Case Western Reserve. Have, have any of them tried to make inroads into the supply chain of Case to sort of sell their products? Or? Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I fundamentally agree with the question's premise, which is it's difficult. Um, and I don't think it's difficult because the government, because in Case's point, we're, you know, we're private, we don't have too many uh, federal restrictions. It's more of just, you know, to, to Dave's point of, you have to align yourself with the real need of that customer, and then there's always just an actual inertia of you know the the buyer, the the hospital, or the university is looking at um, what is the risk of taking on this new intervention or this new supplier versus what we're doing today. And again, that really again, I don't I think it is a, a problem, but I don't think it's a problem caused by the governmental side. I think it's just the reality of it's probably very also hard to sell them to J and J or GE as well because there's a there's an activation energy that's taken. So we've had. Um, a good place where you, where we have seen some traction is in sort of the specialty areas. Um, people selling reagents to laboratories, you know, um, works well because you're used to having sort of niche, fragmented sellers, and and many times you can partner with the uh, the buyer in this case, you know, the laboratory at the hospital or the university um, on a proposal or something, so that you've already teed up that if that's awarded, they're buying your supply. That's part of the production. Um, and likewise, sometimes in IT, we've had some student groups to sell back uh, some, some aids to the university. But for the most part, I agree, it's very difficult to get that first customer. Again, I think it's the same yeah. in the business world throughout. Um, but, but you're also right, that could be a huge area if, if a region were able to offer that. And you especially you're seeing it in digital healthcare of groups saying there's a very low barrier to entry to get into the healthcare uh, continuum of patient engagement. Can you be our first customer, you know, Cleveland Clinic or, you know, Mayo? If you can get that, that has a very high validation effect. A low barrier to technology entry. Is yeah. market, your the question, market, the, yeah. the point about the whole uh, activation energy is a really good one. It's sort of entering the market as actually a different beast. Yeah. That, that, that hurdle has remained high, yeah. you know, throughout time. Yeah, and it probably will. <laughs> we won't exactly. point that one on the government. Yeah, it's not just the government. There are a lot of stifling influences out there. Great. And I think, well, we have a, a question. We have a, a live studio audience here in Cleveland, so we'll go to our local question. Yeah. Hello, Anand here. Uh, I know that we were talking about federal government involvement in research, and then the rules are pretty strict as to what can be done and cannot be done. What if it's just a university research, maybe in Kenya, maybe in, in the U.S.? Uh, how, how much of a control should a university have as to what goes out, given that entrepreneurship is a risky activity. I think Stanford is pretty much, it's wide open, right? You just 
take the innovation run with it and see what comes out of it. Uh, <laughs> or do we do we say that <laughs> wait, let's do the paperwork, get everything sorted out before you run with it? Yes. Great. That's a great question. Joe, maybe I'll let you start yeah, and, and, and maybe this maybe this, it's evolved yeah. during yeah. your time and then the others. Well can these guys have licensed from universities, so yeah. they'll be great. Um, you know, in general, you're right. When there's not a federal side, uh, it gets a little easier. Um, but you know, again, it doesn't mean that, or it could get a little easier. It doesn't mean all universities adopt that sort of laissez-faire or uh, or uh, high customer engagement side. I'm oh, sorry about that. Um, you know, and I think part of it is because since most of the stuff's federally funded, it's just easier to say, let's not try to distinguish what was or wasn't. If 98% of our stuff is, we're just going to go that way. Um, but the other side of it is that. Um, you know, I think they're trying to protect the students and, and the inventors. So we oftentimes will say, look, most of our objections you know, when I ran tech transfer weren't around the economics. You know, that's not about, oh, you're being greedy or you think it's worth more than it should. It's what if you decide to take this on as an entrepreneur in six months, you fail, right? You know, not, not necessarily intentionally or because you did a bad job, but it was just a, a failure point. And now the technology is stuck forever in your enterprise. We need to have that come back so that the, the professor can continue to develop it, so that the students have an opportunity to be entrepreneurs. And um, so I think that you still have issues beyond federal scrutiny, oh, and, and again, in state schools at times, state scrutiny, but you also need to protect the inventors and the other stakeholders who are part of that technology, not just protect the uh, potential economic benefit. Any uh, any reflections from the other panelists about your own experiences? Any places that are doing it more differently or, or in other regions? Well, I, 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 there are a lot of places that do it very different ways. In general, I think universities are very interested in just getting technology out, which is great. You can't just take it out, um, unfortunately, or actually very fortunately for, <laughs> for inventors and for the universities as well. But yeah, most universities are, work really closely with the entrepreneurs to try to create a structure that's win-win, but also, as Joe pointed out, protects a lot of the intricacies of things that could happen, because nothing goes the way you plan, and so you have to be contractually bound in a way that, that uh, anticipates all of the things that could happen, whether you can't find follow-on funding or whether some other uh, party may want to come in and, and also non-exclusively license some of the technology. You have to be covered so that you can maintain uh, uh, flexibility and uh, control of the asset through any potential uh, uh, eventuality that might happen with uh, developing the technology. But my, my experience uh, has been that uh, you know, most universities have standard uh, ways of uh, getting technology out. You kind of start from a standard template and uh, you, you, you could just kind of work through it. I think a hungry entrepreneur uh, can, can get technology out of a university in a pretty straightforward way. The universities that do it more tend to do it better, I think. Yeah, yeah I think the, the biggest uh, goal is to, to not slow down the momentum of the research and of the technology itself. And I think universities that do it really well handle all of the, you know, that making sure the IP is protected, making sure separate books are being kept if that's what's needed, uh, handling uh, and involving the inventors and the entrepreneurs, but uh, handling uh, some of the negotiations with uh, whoever might be involved, whether it might be a licensing entity or uh, venture capital or angels who might be coming in and investing at that stage. So my hint, my tip for everybody at every institution in the world is. Um, Make sure that that inventor or the inventors, the stakeholders, are you're on board, that you're wooing them, that they want to work with you. Because um, again, we were rarely were, was I worried as a tech transfer leader that we were going to get in trouble with the feds or that. What you were worried about was that Dr. So and So, the inventor, was going to go, wait a minute, why in the heck are you working with that group? Or I don't like that company has no assets. Why did we give that? If you can get the inventor on board as the company, and we go to them and they say, yeah, I like this deal. You know, let's work with them. Mm -hmm. you're, I think it's going to it's going to move things or expedite things in a, in a much better fashion. Yeah. I think one other comment, I guess it comes up as I hear the conversation and as I think about the audience that may be listening in today is that um, the typical individual licensing technology to form a company probably has relatively little experience doing that and that may be uh, even more true with a more, more global audience that's participating in a, in a session like this. I get getting smart on uh, what typical deal terms are and what, what, uh, what a reasonable framework is for a license agreement. 
I think is in your in your best interest. Generally, universities are starting from a position of much more experience. They're obviously out licensing technology at, uh, on a daily basis. Really got to get smart as an entrepreneur to understand uh, what what are the important terms to negotiate. What are reasonable ranges around those terms that that would make a sensible uh, 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 license for you? That'll make the whole process go a lot uh, a lot more smoothly. Great, thanks, Steve. Suzanne. We have a live question from Theodoros. Theodoros, you're on with the panel. Theodoros, did you want to go ahead and ask your question of the panel? Okay. We lost him. Okay. Should I? Uh, let's let's hear me now? Uh, yep, we can oh, hear we can you hear now. You. Great, thanks, Theodoros. Uh, okay, great. Hello, my name is Theo. I'm an economist from Greece. We can see you, we can hear you. Thanks, uh, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, a question for you? Oh, great, great. Uh, I'm glad to be part of the conversation. It's a really interesting subject. Um, it is extremely, extremely difficult to find funds to support or even start an anchor institution. And um, investors or even the state are really hard on trusting their funds nowadays. Uh, but on the other hand, it's, it, I think it, it, it's a chance to turn to crowdfunding. And my actual question is, in your experience, how difficult it is to start an informational campaign about the nature of uh, uh, an anchor institution and the building of one in a country with limited funds and low educated people on the subject? Great question. Um, you know, it's interesting, crowdfunding is more and more, and we've seen it in the chat rooms, we're not getting a lot into it in the video lectures, but um, I'm glad that you asked it. Um, Dave, have you seen, I mean, you you sort of went from, I mean, Linestream kind of you were raising capital kind of early on. Now you're sort of in the venture capital phase of things. Do you have any sort of other friends and colleagues that are sort of looking at this sort of early stage research and looking at the crowdfunding angle as a way to, to raise capital, just given some of the challenges of raising traditional venture capital or angel? I have many friends who have gone the crowdfunding route. Um, I, all, I, sh I should say the caveat is none of them have done it from within a university or based on university research. So most of these ideas are coming out from uh, people who have graduated or uh, who are actually working and have a day job but have an idea that they've been focusing on. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, has started a watch company. Uh, nothing, nothing about it is tech, but they have a, a great idea for how to create the nicest watch in the world, and they crowdfunded this, this, this idea. Uh, and um, they went about it. They raised, I think, $150,000, uh, and they launched it. So. Um, I have seen it work uh, a lot, and it's really exciting, and it'll be interesting to see where, you know, how crowdfunding continues to evolve over the next few years. But I haven't seen it for a, a university-born uh, project or research project. So. The technology is tough for crowdfunding, and not for any innate reason. It's not that we're afraid it's going to be illegal or that. Um, one is that there, you need so much money, you know, in, in Steve's world and in our world of you're going to have to raise, you know, 20 to $80 million to get to market. So crowdfunding may be great for the first 200, but the exits are so long and you forever have all these stakeholders. Um, we haven't seen it done real well at a university level. The second area where it's, the question was, is it difficult to start? No, it's, it's real simple, right? It's difficult to, to execute appropriately. I have a friend of mine who leads a very prominent university on the East Coast. And he said they jumped into crowdfunding and thought it would solve all their issues. And they realized that the crowd, it's hard to aggregate the crowd. The crowd was the same people who already knew the university and were going to their traffic. Mm -hmm. And it's like, in theory, it would be great if you could really engage all the potential investors in the world or in the country to come in. But in reality, the only ones who were really they were reaching were the ones who they could have reached through non-crowdfunding areas. And so I think that you know the execution side's a little more difficult. Um, but again, I don't think there's an inherent problem with it. I think that for smaller consumer products or for things that don't need you know, tens of millions to get to market, it, it may just emerge as a very reliable and go-to source for select opportunities, but I don't think it's going to solve all, uh, all our needs in terms of I think we still need the institutional capital uh, sectors aligned to the anchor institutions. Great. Let's go back to Suzanne for a question from the chat room. We have a question from Lori in Rwanda. In the developing countries I've worked in, there seems to be much less respect for entrepreneurship than in the US. Some people seem to see entrepreneurship as almost a last resort. How is a culture of entrepreneurship built? Laura, you, get, you got a twofer. I asked your question <laughs> from the discussion board, and, and that was an excellent question. Um, 
Actually, let me go to Alexis. Alexis, any any reflections on? I mean, I know you're doing a lot of work at Alba around entrepreneurship. Any any reflections on um, how that's working in Greece? If we look at the history of entrepreneurship in Greece, and we go back to right after World War II, when we have a very destructive civil war in Greece. Uh, many people had to move to the larger cities, and most of them had lost their parents either uh, during the World War or because of the Civil War. So we had elevated numbers of entrepreneurship of me. Uh, it was not something people wanted to do, but it was something people had to do to feed their smaller brothers or sisters. From these people, the, the largest big companies now available uh, are actually uh, results of this entrepreneurial activity. So what we see is that it might start as an ecosystem that is based on entrepreneurship of needs, but then it, it, it develops the proper role models to have entrepreneurship of opportunity. Great. Thanks, Alexa. Suzanne? Uh, we have a question from Yvette. Uh, can a lab or center of investigation be started based only on a base of statistics? And two, upon developing a new product, who has ownership of the patents or licenses? The anchor institution or the individual? Great questions. Um, Joe, do you want to uh, talk about how that's done here? Yeah, number two is easy. I'll start with the easy one. Um, yeah, the institutions in almost all cases own the intellectual property. and. Uh, what we try to, to tell people is, and students as well is think about it, forget the fact that they're a nonprofit. At the end of the day, almost any company you work for in the world uh, is going to own the intellectual property that's created. Even you know, if you're a, a, a LLC of one, you'll probably still assign your IP to the corporation for protection reasons. So, um, so it's, it's very rare that the individual will own it. It's actually an exception at times they can request such if the university or the anchor institution decides not to pursue it. But, but the a priori is going to be with the, with the uh, anchor institution. In terms of, you know, can a lab be started based on, was it statistics alone? Um, you know, it, I think there are, again, there aren't any hardline uh, uh, restrictions against what one calls a, a core facility or lab or when one decides to uh, apply for or, you know, take on commerce. Um, it's, it's becoming increasingly hard, though, to get traction. We actually see more of an aggregation of uh, um, a centralization of, of translational resources at the, at the federal and even at the VC levels rather than placing a myriad of bets because, again, there's a, there's a cost to trying to manage all of those. So, uh, but again, not, not a, a hard line exception. Great. Let's take one last question from the chat room, and then I'll ask the panelists to sort of you know, give some closing thoughts. Suzanne? Uh, this question is from Anthony. Anthony wants to ask, the discussion of entrepreneurialism, if I said that right, <laughs> seems to assume that product development requires development of new technologies. Do you have advice for entrepreneurs who are looking for a relationship with the university trained persons to discover how to apply public domain knowledge for product development in a specific market niche? and awesome, yeah. I, in fact, I, I laugh that so many groups want to sort of focus on the eureka moments and the patents that are new when in fact, you know, so many successful enterprises, especially since you can reduce the time it takes to develop, can be based on new applications of existing solutions. And again, if we go with the premise that innovation is a, a uh, process of, that has to be focused on need and, and, and solving, a, you know, providing a solution to a pain point, I, I think it, it is, you know, where I get most excited is when somebody comes and says, you know, I'm not inventing anything new per se, but I, this sensors, I can get off the shelf. It's been used in the automotive and aerospace industries for the last 20 years. It's a dollar six a piece and I could buy it online and now I can apply this to a medical need or to a consumer product and I really think that those are the ones I think that are brilliant so absolutely don't just focus again on the earliest stage research which we've already discussed has, has a lot of uh, negatives or at least a lot of uh, um, polishing that's needed before it has value that's a great question I mean, there's a lot more to sort of innovation and entrepreneurship than the Eureka moment um, and you know, companies are always looking for ways of plugging it. Yeah, they, their core business is what drives them. They're, they're generating revenues from it. If, if there's an opportunity to work in a collaborative arrangement with the university to, to drive the cost of production down and they can extract another few percent uh, margin out of a product, that's a really compelling uh, situation to be in because they don't have to create the market. You know, they're basically able to 
uh, maybe change the manufacturing process, swap out components, so, so forth, and do uh, you know, essentially a refresh of their product line that makes it more competitive or more, more cost effective to, uh, to manufacture. So uh, we, do, we do tend to gravitate towards these eureka moments, but there's a lot of this blocking and tackling uh, activity that goes on that adds a tremendous amount of value. Great. Um, Alexis, let me go over to you just for a final kind of reflection or thought, and then I'll ask our panelists in Cleveland to do the same, and we'll, and we'll wrap things up. So over to you, Alexis. Well, uh, my thought on, on, on this week's topic has been, especially in a country like uh, Greece, that is struggling with uh, unemployment, uh, unemployment, youth unemployment is 60% is whether uh, state-funded and European Union-funded research should be released in the market without intellectual property um, held by universities or research foundations or not. So this is more of, of a question of, a, let's say, a quest to, to what should public policy be like in this uh, situation rather than uh, something that I could contribute. Great. Thanks, Alexis. Dave, a final thought? My final thought. So LineStream has been around for six years now, and, and we, we, last year we just launched our first two products into the market. So uh, we started with a technology looking for a market. Uh, we, we found one. Uh, we think we have a compelling value proposition. But that's a pretty long road to go from 2008 to 2013 before uh, actually having a product out there. So. Uh, there are a lot of uh, complexities uh, that can be imposed on this, on this process, but I'm going to be master of the obvious here and just say, you know, the quicker you can get feedback uh, on an idea that addresses a real pain, you know, that is the core kernel for everything that, uh, uh, everything that is entrepreneurship. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that the people who have uh, asked us questions today go back to, you know, looking at uh, the issues that are around them, the challenges that are around them, and start brainstorming with some friends about it. Yeah, I guess my closing part would be, again, let's not focus on um, research as, as the only value of a research, of an anchor institution. Uh, let's focus on their, their ability to host talent as well as find needs. And um, maybe that's, we've we had questions today. Maybe the reason the anchor institution is important because they're your first customer. Maybe it's because they're where you can hire your first consultant. So let's let's worry a little bit less about patents and, and trademarks and a little bit more about how can you exploit these institutions in a positive way to really build a, a growth stage business around. Great. Well, uh, just, just a few comments. I, I, I to an earlier comment. I think each region is different. Uh, some places have established ecosystems, have really easy to identify anchor institutions. That's certainly not true universally. So I think if you're trying to build out a, uh, an anchor institution-led uh, ecosystem, you really have to wipe the slate clean and think about what are the key assets in your region? What is your region? What are the key assets? And you know, how can you start combining them and building out really networks to work collaboratively to change the ecosystem over time. I think you maybe have to take a broader view of what that anchor is. Uh, it's easy in some regions. I think we have the good fortune here in Northeast Ohio of having academic medical centers and universities and a, a philanthropic environment as well as a venture community. It, you know, banding that together is different than it would be for you know, people who've asked questions from Rwanda or Kenya or, or Greece or elsewhere. Um, so. I guess start with what you have and, and take, again, take the long view and, th and think of uh, you know, driving towards that future yeah, no, you're vision. Right. I mean, a great anchor institution we did talk about there are military bases. The military <laughs> bases are phenomenal yeah. sources of their buyers. They have talent, they have people. Mm -hmm. oh. so uh, for what, I mean, just established businesses can be anchor institutions mm -hmm. as well. I think you can look at pockets across the U.S. as an example where uh, corporations have actually served that role where they brought talent into a region mm -hmm. and actually spun off individuals who are entrepreneurial minded who have actually helped to build out the mm -hmm. local ecosystem. Great. So think more broadly. Well, this is great. I mean, another really rich panel, the hour zip by, at least for us. Um, I hope those of you who are watching will be able to gain, and I'll encourage our panelists to the degree you guys have time. They, the discussion boards are so rich with questions, and I had pages of questions that were raised in the discussion boards we didn't have time to do, so I'll encourage you guys, if you have time, to go in and engage with our students. Um, next week, we turn the discussion to um, access to capital. Um, we actually have three video lectures. Um, coming up, so we'll have the first one is on seed acceleration, the second one is on angel investing, and the third is on venture capital, which is actually the topic that 
all of our panelists have had some, um, some flavor on. Our WebEx will take place next week at an earlier time at 9 a.m. Eastern time on Wednesday. And we have a nice mix of um, venture entrepreneurs, venture capital representatives, angel investors, uh, venture capitalists in China, Jonathan Ortman's from Global Entrepreneurship Week. So um, look forward to seeing you. Again, we always tape these. So for those of you who are watching a taped version of this, um, this will be up uh, shortly. And then um, we'll look forward to seeing you this week in class. So again, thanks for taking the time. And uh, look forward to speaking with you soon.